Hello, I'm Mike Buchanan, the founder and former leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them, j4mb.org.uk. I'm joined today by two beautiful women, but in a sense I'm stating the obvious, because of course all female men's rights activists and anti-feminists are beautiful. In a similar vein, all male MRAs and anti-feminists are handsome and simply irresistible to attractive women. It's a cross we learn to bear. The other interviewer today is Elizabeth Hobson, who has been the leader of J4MB for the past six months. Also with us is Karen Strawn, a long-standing legend of the men's rights movement and widely known by her video blogging pseudonym, Girl Writes What? It's now my pleasant duty to say a few words about this beautiful woman. Karen's a Canadian mother and lives in Edmonton, the city behind me. I hope to see an ICMI staged in Edmonton one day or maybe another Canadian city. Karen was a part-time waitress in 2010 when she started making video pieces in her kitchen, which would turbocharge the men's issues and anti-feminist movement. I don't think there's ever been a more articulate or influential communicator in the movement. Both Karen and I were speakers at the first ICMI held near Detroit in 2014 and hosted by Paul Elam. I was very excited at the prospect of meeting Karen and Paul Elam in particular, and for weeks beforehand, I told myself that when I met Karen, I must not stare at my shoes and mumble something inane like, Hi, Karen, big fan. The truth was, I was as excited to meet Karen as if I were meeting Cameron Diaz, one of my favourite Hollywood actresses. I met Karen in the car park next to where the conference was being held on the first day. Predictably, with the benefit of hindsight, I walked up to her, stared at my shoes, put my hand out and mumbled, Hi, Karen, big fan. Karen spotted my embarrassment, but was very kind. At all five ICMIs we've, we've both spoken at, I've seen men walking up to Karen and doing what I did when I first met her. I asked many men and women at the first conference what had triggered their interest in men's issues and, and anti-feminism. Most of them, maybe 75%, said it had been one of Karen's videos. So even then, six years ago, she was being described as the recruiting sergeant of the men's rights movement. It's always a joy to spend time with Karen at ICMIs, and occasionally we've enjoyed a glass of Sauvignon Blanc together. On one occasion, two glasses. What a night that was, wow. She's also one of the most hilarious women I've ever met. Um, I was thinking of uh, comparing Karen to, uh, you know, pointing out that she's much funnier than any feminist comedian, comedian in the world. <laughs> But that is such a low bar. Um, huh? I think she could roll over it in a, in, on her back. Last year's ICMI was held in Chicago and was a roaring success. It was the best in the series to that point. Alison Tiemann of the Honey Badger Brigade was the chief organizer, but wasn't allowed into the US to personally host the event. So Karen, also a Honey Badger, was the MC in the big presentations room and did a great job. Karen, a very warm welcome. Thank you for agreeing to this interview. Um, my, my first question, how do you see the battles for men's rights and against feminism developing over the next few years? Maybe with an eye on whether the final victor in the US presidential election is a conservative or a socialist. Oh dear, <laughs> uh, that's, that's a big one. I just have to correct you um, on one thing that you said in your introduction. It was more than two glasses of Sauvignon Blanc. It might have been, yeah. I'm, I'm almost positive. So, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you know, like uh, Warren Farrell uh, and the uh, commission, the, the committee to create a White House Council on Boys and Men, uh, they made inroads with the Trump administration, uh, the uh, uh, families advocating for campus equality, which is uh, designed to restore due process to uh, sexual misconduct adjudication on, on college campuses in the States. Um, that uh, made inroads with uh, Trump's education uh, secretary, Betsy DeVos. Um, she clawed back a lot of the overreach in the Obama administration from those dear colleague letters that uh, that I think we've all probably heard about. Um, so, and Trump has actually over the last 
um, several months, created a federal commission on the social status of black men and boys, right? And so what, what we're seeing is we're seeing with Trump, uh, and he also advocates a lot in terms of, or, or talks a lot about uh, things like uh, suicide among, and, you know, deaths of despair among uh, particularly working class white males and, uh, you know, the sort of the uh, receding of uh, the manufacturing base and these kind of really nice, well-paying uh, resource jobs that have always sort of been for men who maybe don't have the intellectual chops or the uh, sort of the psychological wherewithal to want to go and matriculate and go to college and, and become a provider through that, that means, right? Meanwhile, you have Joe Biden saying, you know, if you can drill 3000 feet under the earth to mine coal, you can certainly learn to code. And it's like, no, 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 that's a lot of people tell me that I'm brilliant, right? That I'm absolutely brilliant. And you know what? They're right. I'm not going to argue. But when my husband comes up and starts talking, because he codes every day, multiple programming languages, right, to manage massive systems that involve integrating multiple programming languages into one big system. And he comes out and he starts talking to me about what he's doing. And I just want to stab myself in the face, right? Like there is no way I could learn that. Um, it's just, it's just not something that I could do. And, you know, Jordan Peterson once said, uh, you know, the US military has decided that uh, the cutoff for IQ uh, mm -hmm. to be admitted into the military is 83, right? The US military has decided there is not a single job within their entire organization that you can do with an IQ of less than 83 that's 10% of the population, right? So saying that, oh, we can just get rid of, we can just outsource all of these decent jobs that have been kind of the staple for high school educated men or men with a high school diploma or less who can go on and, and build a decent life, maybe find a partner, have children, support them, right? We can just get rid of those and everybody can just learn to code. That's Biden's solution. Um, Trump's solution is let's bring all of those things back um, and uh, and give the male working class uh, worker a shot at, you know, the pursuit of happiness, the American dream. And so, like, I think, honestly, uh, this election's contested. And if uh, if Biden gets in all of that, every bit of progress that's been, you know, uh, forwarded for males under this administration, whether it's criminal justice reform, prison reform, uh, you know, return of manufacturing, uh, boosting resource jobs, all of those things, right? We're going to, we can kiss all of that goodbye. And we're going to have another, we're going to have four years of, uh, of telling men that they're privileged. Uh, and uh, so no jobs for you. Right. So that that's how I see things playing out if uh, if this election isn't. Isn't resolved in favor of Trump. So I see someone starting up a petition to rerun the election. And <coughs> that would be maybe without postal votes or something. I, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, well, it's, it's, what it's difficult to it's difficult to see um, a solution to this that would that would be less controversial, I think. Um, it, it is. It's 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 really, really upsetting um, because, you know, like there was one county in Michigan, Antrim County, that had uh, a glitch right in their uh, vote tabulation software. Right. And one of the things that I found really hilarious is the voting software is called Dominion. OK, the voting software that messed up during the Iowa caucuses, which is like their version of the primaries. Right was called shadow. It's like, uh, can you be any, like, oh, here's the new voting software. We're gonna call it Illuminati, right? And, uh, oh, too much, too obvious? Okay, we'll call it Sorosware, 
right? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, no, like this is this is ridiculous. But um, but what happened was it, the machines counted the votes properly, but then it spit out opposite results. So it gave all of Trump's votes to Biden and then all of Biden's votes to Trump. And so this very conservative county looked at it and went, Biden landslide, what the hell happened? And they went back and they took a second look. They pushed the button again and it said Trump won by with 56% of the vote, right? That software is being used by 47 counties in battleground states alone. Wow. Right? So we're, we're looking at a situation uh, and my husband has said, yeah, you could hide a script in there that says, you know, if at this time Trump is leading by this much, then flip the result tabulation, right? You could, you could easily do that, right? It'd be very hard to find. You know, you'd have to scroll through millions of lines of code to find that three-line script, right? And uh, so essentially, you know, like 70% of Republicans do not view the election as legitimate. Um, there, there is litigation. There are recounts already uh, scheduled, and uh, and we'll see. We'll see, right? You know, like I, if it turns out after an a transparent process um, that Biden wins, we're going to have to live with that. But um, with seventy percent of one side viewing the election as illegitimate. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't I don't see how you can argue that. I mean, if the Democrats think they won fair and square, they should welcome uh, recounts. They should welcome audits. Mm -hmm. They should maybe even welcome uh, re votes. And they may actually have hold re elections like re a redo in some of these states. It's not unprecedented. It's happened before. So. Right. Interesting. And of course, the, 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 there's this stuff about the software um software problem you know you, you you can be very sure that you can look on the abc bbc cbc and all up to zbc or zbc i should say um and, 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 <laughs> no and, it's z in canada no 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 uh no coverage of it Th thank you karen very very interesting thank, thank you elizabeth well i think it's fair to say that feminism is only one of a number of social justice movements threatening our societies at present so I wonder what it is about feminism in particular that prompted your interest and opposition. Feminism is actually the uh, sort of, it's the Trojan horse for all of these other things, right? I mean, like you can, the, it's very, very difficult to, to convince uh, people to buy into these ideologies, the oppressor oppressed ideologies, particularly if there's a robust middle class, if people are economically well off. I mean, there's a reason why communism uh, sort of, it, it succeeded. I mean, the communist revolutions succeeded in Russia and China and it's because those were feudal states. Um, so you had like this tiny little sliver of people at the very top who were insanely wealthy and everybody else was dirt poor and miserable and there wasn't even uh, the class and case structures uh, didn't even allow you to really advance yourself if you joined the military in those situations. So the rank and file of the military sided with the communists, right? You did not have a middle class. You did not have a, a robust history of, um, of being able to make it on your own steam and your own effort and make a good go of it and make life better for your kids. Right. You know, this is this is the reason why it just didn't take off in Western countries like Germany and and the United States and, and all of that. Right. But when you actually add women into the into the situation. Right. And you use them as the foil. Right. They are the oppressed. Right. That that in that allows you to introduce that model. Right. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's something to be said for the Marxist model, um, you know, like Jordan Peterson said, you know, you give the devil his due, right? You know, Marx wasn't wrong about everything. Um, but there are several models, several lenses uh, in which sociology, uh, you know, views the world. So you got, you know, Marxism, you got uh, uh, utilitarianism, you got pragmatism, you got functionalism, you got all of these different 
ways of examining how society works, right? Marx uh, and feminism only look at that one. They only look through that one lens. So they're always looking at the whole thing as power play. Um, mm -hmm. One person is, is the oppressor. One person is the oppressed. That's all there is to anything. Mm -hmm. um, there's no such thing as fair bargaining. And because they're using women, they're putting women in that role, right? We're all vulnerable to that. We all see that. Um, we see that women are vulnerable. We see that, you know, or we perceive them as vulnerable. We perceive them in all of these ways just naturally. So it really takes a hold of our natural impulses, our evolved impulses mm -hmm. to trick us into believing something that's really not true. And then getting that wedge in the door, then feminism, mm -hmm. you know, puts out a pseudopod and absorbs all these other social justice causes and under its own rubric. And, and now we have the mess that we have now with black studies and colonial post-colonial studies and interdisciplinary studies and all of the various queer studies, grievance studies, all of that. Right. So. Mm -hmm. I recall once you, you were being interviewed, sorry, Elizabeth, were you going to say something? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, some, um, a female interviewer once asked you, um, said something like, right, but, but you were a feminist originally. And you said, no, I've never been a feminist. And she could not get her head round how that was even possible. It was, it was beautiful to watch. I, yeah, no, I always thought that they were like what they were saying, you know, and I mean, this is like starting when I was 10 and, you know, started paying attention to the news when it was playing during dinner and stuff. Um, <clears throat> what the feminists were saying was completely contradicted by my lived reality, right? Mm -hmm. By what I saw around me. My parents were uh, very uh, sort of saw themselves as equal partners, teammates, you know, present a united front, never let us kids play one end against the other, right? Or both ends against the middle. And uh, so we had this, I had this upbringing that was, really largely egalitarian uh there was there was not a whole lot of uh gender role enforcement going on um you know my dad wasn't particularly into housework but he got out the vacuum cleaner every weekend right you know like we had saturday as cleaning day for everybody right and he got out, got out the vacuum cleaner. He often uh, did dishes and things like that. My mom often went out and cut down trees in the yard and, you know, things like that. So, I mean, I got up on the roof to check the shingles after, uh, you know, a windstorm. Um, so I grew up in this, in this family where, you know, and, and the, the best Christmas present I ever got when I was a kid, eight years old, I got that, not just the space Lego set, but the big space Lego set that was, it cost the equivalent, I think in adjusted dollars, would have cost my parents if they bought it now, um, almost a thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah, because so, Lego was really expensive back so, then. So, 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 so you're right, so that was 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, you know, your math's not adding up. Um, yeah, no, that would have been that would have been a 41, almost 42 years ago. So, yeah. I think you must be using the same same uh, face cream as Mallory Millet. That's all I can say. I just think that I smudged some Vaseline on the lens up here. <laughs> so. OK, is it is it my my I, I love that. Um, I love that story. I, I'd love to meet your parents one day. And who knows if we they live in Edmonton as well. Currently. They do. I'd love to meet them. Some of the story, I mean, your mother cutting down trees. I mean, I got to meet that woman. Oh man, she cut down, she, this is probably the reason why I ended up masculinated, uh, masculinized in the womb. It's because when she was seven months pregnant with me, she was out in the front yard in a bikini, cutting down a tree. Yeah. And, and, and you, were, you were saying before we started recording that uh, it can get to 40 degrees Celsius below zero and you yeah. don't own a pair of boots. No, I don't own a pair of boots. Yeah, you, you, so. you, you Canadians are hard. 
And mm-hmm. I, I love the story. Um, we, 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 we chatted about this in Chicago. Uh, I remember you, you told me that your dad, if you, if you went to your dad and said you were hurt, he'd say, where's the blood? And if there wasn't any blood, then he, he, he you know, he just said, I'll go away. And that was yeah, just... no, he, he, his, he it, it was, if there's no blood, it doesn't hurt. But you went to him with blood once and he still dismissed it. I can't remember the details. Yeah, he, he, yeah. and I was like, but there is blood. And he was like, God, ah, stop being a pussy. Yeah, there's not and, much. Uh, there's not much. Yeah, it's not, it's not a lot. I mean, like when I was actually genuinely, like seriously hurt, and that was a couple of times, um, he was always, you know, right on it. But if it was just like, eh, I'm bleeding, oh no. And it was just I'd, like, I'd, yeah, love, whatever. I'd love to meet them. They should be guests of honor and I say, am I? <laughs> maybe we'll have one in uh, edmonton next summer and yeah. uh yeah once the miracle biden vaccine comes yeah. out you know because yeah. he's going to take credit for that lovely, <clears throat> since there's one doing, on the horizon perhaps they could do a joint um icmi talk or something that would be that'd be awesome karen you gave the well-received keynote speech at the 2018 conference in london titled why women must consign feminism to the dustbin of history. We'll put a link in the load bar. Oh. Hello, anti-feminist hotline. <laughs> you have video evidence of a lesbian relationship between Harriet Harman MP and Jess Phillips MP. Yes, please do send me the video. Yes, yes. Um, I'm sorry, I can't talk more at the moment because um, I'm with Elizabeth Hobson interviewing Karen Strawn uh, for the forthcoming conference, um, which starts in a few days. Oh, good grief. Yes, OK. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll tell them. I'll tell both of them you're a big fan. Yes. Thank you, Ken. Um, pr- pr- perhaps call back in an hour and we'll, we'll, we'll have a chat then. OK, thanks, man. Bye for now. Bye for now. Sorry about that. Sorry, <laughs> but, I, but I'm I, I'm uh, I have a commitment. That I will always answer the anti-feminist hotline. It rings at the worst times. Uh, where was I? Oh yes. So your your video, why women must consign feminism to the dustbin of history. And as uh, you know, we will put a link in the low bar to that. Um, the 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 take home message I got from your talk, Karen, was that women must consign feminism to the dustbin of history because men can't or won't. In the Q&A session that followed your talk, someone asked, uh, someone asked you what would have to happen to make more women publicly self-identify as feminists. You replied that anti-feminism would have to become cool. And I must confess, I groaned when I heard you say that because my immediate thought was that anti-feminism could never become cool among women. Two years on from that talk, I'm absolutely astonished to see that anti-feminism is becoming cool among women of all ages and particularly young women. What more might MRAs of both sexes do to encourage more women to join our movement? Oh, I think, you know, honestly, uh, tell them what's in it for them. And I, you know, I know it sounds kind of ruthless, right? But tell them what's in it for them. I mean, you don't, when I look at my my anti-feminism, I'm not just thinking about my sons, right? I have two sons and I have a stepson. Um, I'm not just thinking about them. I'm thinking about my daughter. I'm thinking about, you know, what kind of partner is she going to be able to find if every one of the men her age are kind of struggling under this burden of, you know, the male privilege uh, kind of narrative and the uh, affirmative action you know, she's going to, if she decides that she wants to get married and have children, um, I'm sure she's going to want to stay home and look after her children when they're small, the way I did. Uh, Absolutely 100% positive that that's what she would want to do. Um, She's going to need a male partner who's going to be able to support her in doing that. And you know, I, I know that this sounds like traditionalism, but I think that if there were no artificial... Uh, prop ups for women in terms of their, you know, sort of economic contribution, if you want to call it that, uh, to the workforce and and things like that. Um, if there were if there were no artificial assistance 
for women to be economically uh, independent, if you want to call it that, um, then 80% of people would fall into a traditional mm. arrangement like that because it would be their best option that would make them the happiest, right? And I think that because we've artificially created a bunch of options that are kind of illusory, they, they, we say women are independent, they're not. Um, they're, they're, we say they're independent from men, they're not. Uh, we've just outsourced the one man that they would be dependent on to the male tax base. Um, once we've destroyed the male tax base with all of these artificial props for women uh, to be hired above and beyond men and promoted above and beyond men, once we've done that, um, there's not going to be that tax base. The whole thing's going to collapse. And so I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, my, my daughter would really benefit from, uh, getting rid of this false narrative of, you know, how men oppress women and how society is built by men to oppress women for men's benefit and all of that other BS. So, yeah. <laughs> I think though, you know, what you've got there is a very rational argument and I'm not a hundred percent sure <coughs> that women as a whole are very receptive to rational arguments. I <laughs> really, you don't say, um, <laughs> That's why the fashion angle uh, really helps. Um, but all and also, you know, you can sort of, I guess you could you could pull the whole look at the aesthetics. Who are anti-feminist women? Mm. They're generally attractive women like you, Elizabeth. And who are the feminist women? They're women like Rachel Maddow. Mm. Um, you know, they're women like Kate Smirthwaite. Oh. Uh, you know, they're, they're women who, uh, in terms of their looks and their personality are, are you know, uh, not necessarily horrible uh, in terms of their looks, but insufferable in terms of their personalities. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it and, you know, like, here's the thing too, right? A lot of people think because I'm an activist, right? I go out every day and I like push my agenda on other people and all of that. Um, no, every day I go out to my grocery store, to my pharmacy, to uh, wherever I need to go to run errands and I chat with people and I'm happy and I'm, and I joke with them and, uh, and, you know, people do recognize me. I actually just had one of the security people who's, who was posted at the door of the grocery store to keep people not wearing masks out even though they always let me in without a mask um, because, you know, they actually have to let you in even if you're not wearing a mask. Um, but uh, he, you know, he's got a, the little spray bottle of hand sanitizer and I put out my hands and I say, hello, how's it going? And he says, do you do YouTube? And I said, yeah. And he says, oh, wow, you know, you're great. Thanks for all the work that you do, right? I mean, I get that all the time, but at the same time, it's like, it's not the way I interact with people mm. on a daily basis, you know, like somebody makes a joke that might ha might be seen as anti-male. I can laugh along with it, just like I can laugh along with anti-female jokes. I can laugh along with anti-LGBTQ jokes. I can laugh along with anti-straight jokes, anti-white jokes, anti-black jokes, anti-anything jokes, um, as long as somebody doesn't seem to as long as it's a joke and it's not mean spirited it's just a joke um you know i i just i i don't have that chip on my shoulder and i think that that's another thing that i think really we could tell women you know because it's feminism is it can't be a very positive message to take out with you into the world every day um that you know the entirety of society is against you. Um, and if that were true, if that were actually the case, then sure, go ahead and take that message out with you into the world every day. But because it's not true, wouldn't you rather be happy? Wouldn't you rather not be afraid mm. when you're out in public? Wouldn't you rather not assume that anyone who, you know, says something that maybe makes a joke that, is awkward or whatever, 
Oh yeah. That book. That's great. <laughs> um, you know, but not everything is intended to push you down, right? Not everything that like somebody might just be having a bad day and they get snippy with you. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily because you're a woman. It's not necessarily because you're a person of color. It's not necessarily, you know, somebody gives you a, you know, a frowns at you as they're walking. There was this one guy. Okay. So I'm standing in the grocery store and this is before they used to put the price per gram on the actual tag, right. On the, on the counter tag. Right. So I'm trying, right. I've got all these different packages of cheese, brands of cheese, and I'm, and they're all different sizes, 620 grams, 800 grams, 906 grams, right? You know, 1.1 kilogram, right? And I'm trying to calculate, okay, what is the lowest price per gram of cheese? Because I was poor at the time, right? I could not afford to just buy whatever, whatever looked right or looked best, right? So I'm trying to figure out, calculate in my head, what's, which package of cheese is, I'm, you know, is going to be the lowest price per gram. So of course I'm frowning. I'm like this. And, uh, and I'm staring off into the middle distance. And this guy is standing beside me and he's, I just vaguely noticed him. Right. And he's looking at my butt. Okay. And, uh, and then all of a sudden he's like, he realizes that I'm looking at him. And he's like, oh, and he takes off. He like, he like just beats a hasty retreat. And, and I realized, oh God, he thinks I'm frowning at him because (laughs) he was staring at my butt. Right. And I wanted to chase after him and go, no, no, it's okay to stare at my butt. Right. (laughs) It's all right. Uh, These jeans make my butt look great. I was trying to figure out the price of cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but yeah, by then, by the time I realized what had happened, it was too late. Like, but it's, it's just like, why, why would somebody want to, why would a woman, right? And women are already more prone to negative emotion than men are on average. Why would you want to exacerbate that with a fiction? With a fiction. Can you imagine Laura Bates in that scenario, Karen? Oh God, she'd write a book about it. (laughs) She has. (laughs) I know, You're I know. Been, I've been, been fine with the damn things. Honey Badger Radio uh, has. We've been sort of deconstructing that book, "Men Who Hate Women," mm. or whatever it is. Um, and I can't, you know, like I, I, I think I'm going to have to tell them, you know, because uh, uh, Brian wants to do the whole book, the whole audio book. Oh wow! Right? Which, which would take a year and a half <laughs> of of live streams, but, and, and I think I'm going to have to tell him I can't, I can't, you know, because I'm going to have to jump off a building at some point. Right. Um, being forced to, you know, and her, her voice is so seductive <laughs> but at the same time, so much childlike and innocent, but a little sexual too. <laughs> right. And, and she, is really very convinced like th- this woman she should she should like she should apply as a voice actor on the no sleep podcast well this is a horror did. podcast that was, that was her first career choice acting but it didn't work out for her so well, she she'd do very-, very well she'd do very well narrating mm-hmm. horror stories i think you know for me i wonder whether one of the keys to reaching women is actually you know um because i i was a feminist and one of the reasons i got into it was because i was like oh sisterhood that'd be nice oh i didn't find it in feminism a load of like cliquey bitches who were always like you know now it's a it's a glamour model now oh it's a stay-at-home mother now you know what i mean but in the men's human rights movement i found sisterhood And, you know, I know Natty has this kind of organization that she keeps getting too pregnant to work on um, (laughs) called 
the Women's Liberation Network. And oh, I she got another one on the way or she just does. arrived? She does, another one on the way, yes. She's, she's, been pre- she's, she's been permanently pregnant for about five years now, hasn't she? Yeah, no, Miles yeah. was like such a sweetie. He made, he yeah. really, uh, he really um, was just like, I, I spent so much of 2018 uh, snuggling that baby. I've got some nice pictures of you with him. <laughs> well, you know, lucky for me, my tubes were tied, uh, you know, several, <laughs> a, a decade or two ago, because it used to be if I touched anybody's baby, I'd end up knocked up. You know, if I borrowed someone's toothbrush, I'd get pregnant. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, it was it was safe to touch the, the adorable little baby. It was, mm. it was very nice. At this point, you're a veteran in the men's human rights movement. I wonder what changes you discern in the movement compared to when you started working within it. Oh, the changes are it's gone way more mainstream. It's just it's just gone like when I look at the, the number of interviews that I do on uh, conservative talk radio down in the States, um, you know, with really friendly hosts, right? Very, very friendly, very open to, you know, male and female, open to talking about the issues. Um, they already have sort of a basic understanding of what's going on, of what we're about. And they're extremely uh, interested in, in sort of hearing what I have to say. And it's, it's just kind of like, um, it's, I mean, it, it really is, and this is one of the things that I have warned liberals about for ages and ages and ages, is that, you know, what you're doing is essentially handing men's issues to conservatives. That's, that's, that's all you're doing. You're just allowing conservatives to own these issues, when in reality, if you were actual true liberals, you would embrace the men's rights movement. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, it, it's definitely, there are, are a lot of people, I don't know whether you'd call them pink-pilled or purple-pilled mm-hmm. or red-pilled, um, but you can definitely see that it's gaining traction mm-hmm. in the mainstream. People are aware of it. The things that I say on these radio shows that I've been going on for the last two years or so um, no longer surprise the hosts. Um, they know about them. So it's, it's actually, it's really good to see that. And it's good to see, you know, things like Trump's federal commission on the social status of black men and boys, because that's the wedge in the door to maybe get that White House counsel on boys and men uh, in there, except not if Biden wins, but you know. No, we, we, we interviewed Warren Farrell twice for this conference. And in the second one, we, we, we raised the issue of the election and he was really clear that if Trump, um, if Trump, you know, eventually is the victor, that that um, that that the prospects of a count, White House counsel on boys and men were so much stronger and it would never happen, never happen under Biden. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, they've they've had so much more success in terms of lobbying with uh, Congress people who were on the Republican side. Uh, in terms of like bringing it up and and all of that that and in terms of cabinet members with Trump than they ever did in the seven years or so that they tried to do that with Obama right so I mean there it really is um, if we want a White House council on boys and men right Trump needs to win this contested election um, otherwise, it's on hold for another four years until Trump runs again in 2024. At which point he'll be how old? Uh, he'll be 78. He'll be as old as Joe Biden. Biden. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Elizabeth, go on. So, uh, well, I was just going to ask, you know, on balance, bearing in mind what we've been talking about, are you hopeful or are you scared of what the future holds? Uh, in in terms of men's men's in issues, terms, yeah, for men and boys' well being, and and also women and girls' well being, because you know every time there's an injustice, the ripples echo out, don't they? They do, and you know I think Generation Z or Z, 
um, holds that they give me some hope. My son is uh, my younger son is a prime example of Generation Z. He's uh, he was subjected to all of that indoctrination from kindergarten all the way to when he graduated this last spring and uh, from grade 12. And he didn't buy any of it. He, he just is not buying it. Um, you know, he's not. How old is he? He's uh, he just turned 18 in July. So he's yeah. uh, but he's he's definitely a free thinker. He <laughs> definitely thinks uh, like. He never said this to his social studies teacher in grade nine. Ever to his face, but in private and among his friends, he referred to the guy as Mr. Cuck. Okay. <laughs> because the dude was a total lefty social justice guy. And then Sam was not, he was not going to buy any of that bullshit. And it's, so I think that, I think that there are a lot of young people coming up now in, in terms of, it, it's almost as if they're rebelling against what the adults around them are telling them. Right. So, um, so, you know, we may be going through a cycle of, of resistance to, the adult establishment yeah. idea, right? And, uh, and that includes um, a lot of young people who are rejecting social justice ideologies and feminism and all of those things. So I, apparently in the United States, Generation Z is the most conservative uh, generation of young people in history. Mm -hmm. So... In part, I guess, because they see the wreckage that feminism has led to. Oh, I think so. I think, you know, they grew up with their parents divorced and all their friends' parents divorced. And, you know, and and all of the uh, the pap that's the social justice pap that's being forced down their throats in school. And and uh, they're, they're just saying no thanks. So I think that that's a lot to do with it. I think it's part one part rebellion and one part experience. Mm -hmm. And uh and they're just rejecting it uh, to a greater degree than any generation since maybe the 1960s. Right. A young generation. So. Um, Karen, thank you so much for joining us. That was, I knew that would be fascinating and you've exceeded our very high expectations. So thank you very much. Um, I'm, uh, um, I'm just one of countless MRAs who, who, who love you to pieces. And, oh. uh, and I hope you keep doing your work. <laughs> I hope you keep doing your work for, for, for many, many years to come. Well, I will absolutely stay on it. Um, might be fewer videos, but um, because I feel like when I post something to my channel, I'm largely preaching to the choir. Um, but when I talk on a radio show, uh, I'm, it's virgin bums on virgin seats. And so it always feels new when I'm doing that. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, and I look forward to the next time that we that we uh, have a couple of glasses of Sauvignon Blanc, or maybe more than a couple, or maybe more than. A couple. <laughs> Karen, thank you so much. It's a wrap. Thank you. <laughs>